Good evening, everyone. Was able to get the yard mode right before the rain. It makes me just feel fantastic. Yeah. It's one of those good things that can happen right before the rain. Um, don't really have anything new to announce. I just wanted to emphasize um, uh, the manuals, of course, coming to join us here at Cherokee. We're excited about that. Won't go over the whole living together arrangement and all that again. But um, uh, Robert Taylor, let's keep him in our prayers uh, about his gallbladder. Um, I haven't heard anything new since this morning, so let's pray that everything maybe is the same. But um, remember the uh, gospel meeting we have coming up in uh, early October, and also remember we're going to have a meal before the, uh, or I'm sorry, after the morning service, and uh, Group C will be taking care of that, so keep that in mind. And then, just because she deserves it again, Hannah, thanks so much for what you did with the Women's Day and the 15 women that were able to go from our congregation. That's very uplifting. And then uh, lastly, uh, October the 8th, that Sunday through uh, the end of December, Doris will be teaching a new ladies class on uh, women of the Bible. And uh, of course, would encourage all the ladies to uh, to go back there again uh, to study about the women of the Bible. I, I don't have anything new. Thank you. If you're following in the hymn book, we'll be starting with a song, hymn number 227. 227, and we'll be singing all three stanzas. Let's sing. On Zion.
Let's all bow. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thanking you for this day that you bless us with, for all the blessings of life that you give us. Father, we're thankful for this congregation here. We're thankful for the elders, for the deacons, and for Brother Drew and his family. For the whole congregation, Father, we're, we're just thankful. We ask that we continue to love each other, to do the things that we need to do. Father, we ask that as we're coming up on the 1st of October in our gospel meeting, we ask that it will be a success, that you bless it, that you bless Brother Wayne and his good wife, that you be with each and every one that comes nightly to the meeting. We ask that we would be out telling people about this meeting and that many things good will come about this and through this and souls will be added to the kingdom. Father, we love you. We know that you love us because you sent your son to die on that cruel cross that we might have that hope of heaven someday. Father, we look forward to that day when you come back. We ask that you forgive us of our many sins, that you continue to watch over us and continue to bless us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The next hymn book, I could not find the next hymn book, I could not find the book, so I did ask you to put it on the uh, board here. But I had another book that I had. Earthly wealth and fame may never come to me, and a powerless faith in mine may never be, but the cross of faith is right. 
Next time number. 113. 113. We'll sing both stanzas. will be 9-12. Oh, yeah, 9-12. But correction. Yeah, 9-12. Good to be with everybody again this evening. Appreciate you being here and uh, glad we're able to come together again this evening and talk about uh, second part to heaven and maybe some errors pertaining to it. Once again, I'll just remind you, I'll do this again Wednesday. Uh, if you haven't signed up the sheet for the workshop this Saturday, it'd be good to know. Uh, I was talking to Betty a little bit earlier and she was saying if we could just get a, a more concise count on who will be there for food, that is, it'll just make it a little bit easier. If you need to bring your kids, bring your kids. It's not a problem. I think a number of kids are already planning on being there anyway. Uh, so go ahead and sign the sheet there in the in the foyer and uh, come and enjoy the workshop together. We're talking about heaven this evening, but specifically we're talking about errors. I'll do it in five different ways. Number one, the who. Number two, the what. Number three, the when. Number four, the where. And number five, the why. Let's clarify just quickly. Uh, number one, the who. Who will be in heaven? Well, the Bible's very clear. It's not going to be everybody. 
so there's a certain elect class, and the elect class are those who have responded in the appropriate way to the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Number two, the what. It's a spiritual place. It's not a place of materialism. And uh, for whatever reason, like we talked a little bit about this morning, there are caricatures of what heaven will be like, and a number of them are extremely materialistic. We need to understand that whatever the Bible is saying about heaven, it's assuming that we're reading these as metaphors. Metaphors because we're shorted with the language, the rhetoric, the vocabulary. We're shorted because of the dimension in which we're set right now. Whatever they're saying, it's saying something about a place that's trying to convey or trying to relate truths to us, but it's that ultimately of a spiritual nature. Number three, the when. It's going to be inhabited at the second coming, and we'll talk about the Hadean world just a bit. We did that last week. We'll say another piece about it this evening. Number four, the where is that it's not on earth, and there's a very popular view right now, uh, which is basically that heaven is going to be on a renovated earth or a refurbished earth. We'll say a thing about that on point number four. And then point number five, the why. Uh, the why we want to go to heaven is because it's not actually a tedious or a boring place. If you're bored out of your minds with this idea of eternal prayer meetings and gospel meetings and singings and all of that, don't fret. I'm not quite sure that's the right take on all of this anyway. So we'll say a thing about that at the end. Number one, who's going to be there? Well, look at Matthew chapter 7. Whatever we make of this, Jesus is the one who speaks it. And I'm astonished. You're probably astonished by this too if you've read the contemporary literature. Uh, but I'm astonished. You're astonished by contemporary quote-unquote evangelical Christians saying that, well, you know, Jesus didn't say anything about X, Y, or Z. The biggest one that I'm thinking of right now is that Jesus didn't say anything specifically about the LGBT community. Well, that, I'm not really sure that that matters. He endorses Genesis, Matthew chapter 19. His whole worldview is quote-unquote Christian the whole way through. The way I'm reading the text is Jesus is endorsing his Old Testament, which actually has an awful lot to say about the LGBT community. And it's not saying that we ought to be hateful, we ought to be despairing towards them, none of that kind of thing, but it is saying that we ought to say this is what the Bible says about this. So Jesus endorses Genesis. But what I also find interesting is that Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in 13, does make this remark, which is extremely anti-pluralistic. It says in Matthew 7 and verse 13, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. In 7.14, on the contrast, it says, The gate is small or narrow, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. I find it very striking that Jesus comes right out and says quite explicitly that the way to glory, the way to heaven, is going to be underpopulated. And the way to eternal destruction is going to be overpopulated. That's just the way it is. And Jesus says this not making a prediction per se as to say, uh, to predict our futures for us. But he's just going to say this is the way it is. You know, ever since the way that the world has gone for the last 6,000 years, people have generally made predominantly the wrong choice. And it results in destruction. Now, I find that a little bit interesting because in our contemporary era, if you go to a funeral this week, more than likely, the person's funeral that you're attending, no matter what kind of individual he or she was, according to the preacher, is probably going to heaven. You know what I mean? And that's really in the face of the biblical text at this point. Now, I'm not trying to claim that I'm the judge, the final judge. After all, I believe in an omniscient God who can vary out all of the variables. And so if you are a mentally handicapped individual, and I, Drew Leonard, don't know it, but God does, well, he can sort that business out. If you're an individual who maybe wasn't of an accountable age, maybe you're right there on some kind of line, if we can imagine it that way. Is 12 years old too old or too young to obey the gospel? I'm not sure, and I'm sure that varies on the individual and the experiences and the educational level and a number of things. God, our God, who's omniscient, is able to know all of the variables and measure all of that out. And so when we think about who's going to be in heaven, I'm not exactly sure about all of the variables for all of the individuals, but I know this. My Bible gives us a plan of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ and in connection with that it assumes a context for the responsible accountable individual where it says you've got to obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ 2nd Thessalonians 1 8 through 10 
but I also believe in a fair God, and I'm allowing God to be God. If there's an individual, for whatever reason God sees fit, to let into heaven who, quote-unquote, hasn't obeyed the gospel plan of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, well, I'm content to let God be that individual, too. That's not me crawfishing on the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, folks. That's me saying that I believe in a God who is fair, who is just, who takes all of the variables into consideration. I heard a story a couple of years ago. We were talking about this in the class back in the other room a couple of quarters ago. And I heard of a case in Bait City, Missouri, where there were children, catch this, they weren't children, they were fully adult age, and they had been locked up in cages since they were born. This came out in the news, this is 20 minutes from where we live, and uh, these sick individuals had locked kids up for 20 plus years, and then these kids were found, you can imagine the kind of social skills they had, right? Well, are they accountable before God? I don't know, but I don't have to know either. I'm very, very... Um, oh, let's say thankful, very thankful that I can turn that over to God and say, you make the call on that one, God. And if you see fit to send them to everlasting punishment, I think God's committed to the plan of eternal redemption, don't you? So I think it's his call. He knows what's best. He's committing to saving as many as possible. And so we believe in the right and fair God. We believe in the right kind of God, but also from the God who came in flesh, he himself made the declaration, few there will be. That will find it. Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14. That's explicitly from the lips of Jesus. We've got to take that for what it is. Number two, heaven is a place that's not material. It's a place that is spiritual. Now, we looked at a number of these passages this morning, or I at least brought them up. It talks about the crown of life in a couple of them. It talks about a city that we're looking for. It talks about a country we're looking for. But if you flip over to Hebrews chapter 12 with me, there's a remark made about this quote-unquote city to which the ancients of the Old Testament were looking and in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in 22, he sets this contrast up between the old Mount Sinai and the new Mount Zion. And he says, old Sinai was this way, that way, and the other. But he says, on the other hand, in 1222, the saints that he's addressing, the Hebrews, have come, have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. They've come, presently that is, to the heavenly Jerusalem to the myriads of angels, and catch this in 23, 12, 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, the firstborn ones is the plural in the Greek, who are enrolled in heaven. It's a church comprised of Christians is what he's saying in 12, 23, who are enrolled in heaven and to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Now catch this. Here's what he's aiming at in 12, 22, and 23. He says that we... The New Testament church, the people of God, are the city to which we've always aspired to reach anyway. But the point he's also making is that there is an already but not yet aspect to all of this. Now that's a little bit tricky to wrap our minds around, but here's what he's aiming for. We are already experiencing a foretaste of glory divine right now in the New Testament church. But he awaits a full consummation. Of, oh, Seth, I must have given you the impression my voice was bothering me. <laughs> Sorry about that. But, but thank you for the water all the same. Uh, it is what it is, you know. I don't know what else to say. Uh, thank you. I can say thank you. Hebrews 12, 22 and 23, he's getting at this idea that the church is a foretaste of what is yet to come. We're imperfect. But in Romans chapter 8, he does this sort of thing the whole way through Romans 8 and 9. He says, we're already glorified. Well, oh, is that true? Because in Romans 8, he goes on to say that we shall still yet be glorified. He says, now we're already adopted. We're already adopted as sons. But then he says in Romans 8 and 9, but there's still an adoption yet to come, specifically the redemption of the body. What the writer, Paul, is toggling between is the already, what we're already experiencing and what is yet to come. It's not that we haven't already been glorified, adopted, saved, justified, sanctified, and any of that. We already have been. But the full consummation of the thing is still yet to come. It's kind of like within Joshua chapter 6. You remember where uh, God tells Joshua, he says, you're going to march into the city six times, right? One on each of the days. And the final day you're going to go around it seven times, 13 total times. And he says in Joshua 6 too, see, I have given already. I've already given you this city, Jericho. They haven't even marched yet. 
but it was as good as done because God is faithful and he's promised. And that's the same point that the New Testament is bringing out. We are already experiencing our glorification, our sanctification, our justification, our salvation. All of these things we're already experiencing now, but the full consummation of what that's going to look like will come when? At the second coming. And that's what Hebrews chapter 12, 22 and 23 is honing in on. Let's move into point number three. When is this going to happen? Well, it's at the second coming. Look at this very important passage with me in John chapter 3. Jesus, of course, is here with Nicodemus. And he's saying a couple of things about this water baptism that's recently developed with John the Immerser and himself, Jesus. Though it says in John 4, 1 and 2, Jesus personally did not baptize any of his disciples, but... He was taking them there to the water, and somebody was doing the baptizing. John 4, verse 1. Now, this is about John 3 and verse 13, if you're there with me. He says, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Now, it looks like to me, then, there's an important point. When is heaven going to be inhabited by people, humans? Well, it looks like it's not going to come until the second coming. In John 3, the statement is made, Nobody has yet ascended into heaven. Now, that's a little bit odd because, well, it's not odd. The text is what it is. But I find it odd that at a lot of funerals, we preach people straight into heaven. You know what I mean? And if I'm reading it correctly, that's not exactly right. That's not exactly where people go. Now, let me tell you a quick little thing. Um, show of hands, who's heard of the name Gus Nichols? Good, a good number of us. How many of you have heard of the name Guy Woods? Good. Uh, his middle initial is Guy in Woods, but I, Guy in Woods kind of sounds a little bit odd, don't you think? You know. Anyway, uh, I, guess, I suppose a man's name is what it is. But here's the point. Both of these fine gentlemen, good Bible students, I know where they're coming from. I don't like the view. They held this view that Hades was emptied in AD 70 at the fall of Jerusalem. Now that's very odd, isn't it? Now why they think that is because of a number of exegetical reasons, and I think there's flatly wrong on the point. I don't think that Hades was emptied and now from 70 AD forward people go either directly to heaven or directly to hell. You talk to me about that if you're interested in the subject later on. But Guy Woods and Gus Nichols both held such a view. I don't think that the text will support such a thing. John 3.13 says that no man has yet ascended into heaven except for the one who came, lived the life, and then was glorified. And that's because he holds a very unique spot. Why right in the same chapter it calls him the only begotten son, which is a very unique title to say the least. Jesus is God in the flesh. So it makes sense that he would be seated at the right hand of God in a very personal way, wherever, wherever is not the right word, but something like it, wherever that is. And I think that if we're reading the text rightly, what happens at this point, if somebody dies, one individual goes either directly to paradise or goes directly to what we would call Hades, specifically as Luke 16 has it, torments. So it's kind of a waiting compartment if I'm reading all of this correctly. I think 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 supports that kind of thing because he says that the Lord will come in the clouds and he still has to receive those who are already dead in Christ to take them home. What business does he have at the second coming taking them home if they're already entering heaven at that point forward? You see what I'm saying? It, it, there's no taking them home. They're already there. And so 1 Thessalonians 4, along with some of these other passages that I'm re referring to, support the idea that upon death, you and I are going to either go to paradise or torments. Why Luke chapter 23, 43, there's the thief. He's hanging on the tree next to Jesus. And he says, Lord, you remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what does the master tell him? He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, if you take this idea that after the cross, about 37 years, 70 AD would somehow empty all of the Hadean world. If you hold that view, you hold that view. And I'm not necessarily chiding you for it, though I don't think you're right. Uh, so, so that is what it is. I think this, flip over to this passage with me in Philippians chapter 1. Paul talked about this, and this is a little bit of a hiccup, but I think it's explicable. This is Philippians chapter 1, beginning in 21. Paul talks about, and of course he's sitting in a Roman cell at this point, so I think that would uh, kind of accelerate his emotions. Philippians chapter 1 and 21 says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But, he says in 22, if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. And he says in 23, but I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. 
2 uh, Corinthians 5, 3, 5, 6, and 5, 8 all say nearly the same thing, where he says we will be with the Lord. Now, some think that to mean then that what's going to happen upon immediate death, if you were to die right now from a heart attack, you would go directly to heaven with Christ or directly to torments, which is the alternative. I don't think that's a correct reading of these texts in light of everything else I've just said. I think that what he's saying when he talks about being with Christ is the same kind of thing that the thief is told in Luke 23, where he said, you'll be with me in paradise. That's not to say that you're in heaven personally, but I think it's to say that you're with Christ in a more accelerated sense. Does that make sense? So it's not the same as here, but it's not the same as heaven either. It's that intermediate state. I think that's what he's aiming for in passages like Philippians 1, 23, 2 Corinthians 5. I think that's what he's aiming at. When will heaven be inhabited? I think ultimately it's at the second coming where 1 Thessalonians 4 does say the Lord will come in the clouds and take those that are saved back to heaven. The alternative, of course, is implied. Let's look at point number four. This is where I'll spend the majority of my time for the rest of the evening. Where will heaven be? Well, I'm certain, I am certain, you may not be, but I am fairly certain that it's not on earth. If you take a look, though, at Matthew 6, as we did this morning, 1 Peter 1, it talks about how heaven is an inheritance which is for us. It's a heaven which is reserved in heaven for you. Our inheritance is in heaven reserved for us, it says. Now, that's a little bit interesting because there's a view out there now arguing, and it's called renovated earth or refurbished earth, and the idea is that heaven will be on a renewed planet. Following the second coming of Christ, Heaven is going to be on this planet, but the curse has been removed. I'll say something about that a little, in just a little bit. But let's take a look at at least two, maybe three of the arguments raised by this view as to why it comes about. Flip over to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5. Here's a tricky little remark, but I think it's again explicable. In Matthew chapter 5, especially verses 3 through 12, we have the arrangement of the Beatitudes. And one of the remarks made by the Master in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5 is blessed are the gentle or the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I listened to the forum between uh, Dan Chambers, uh, he's got a couple of master's degrees in theological studies, and then Ralph Gilmore, who's a doctoral professor at Freed Hardeman. And they had a discussion on this idea of renovated earth uh, back in 2017 at Harding University's lectures. Now the interesting thing is that Dan Chambers takes the position that heaven is going to be on a renewed, renovated, refurbished earth. Gilmore, of course, opposed the idea. Gilmore's got some helpful things to say, but in a lot of ways I differ from him too. That's not really helpful for us, is it? Well, here, let me tell you where I'm headed. Chambers said that in Matthew 5, 5, you explained the phrase, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. And he interprets this to mean something like our eschatological reward, our final reward in heaven is actually going to be a convergence between heaven and earth coming together in a renewed, without the curse brought by Adam, kind of state or form. Now, I think that's a little bit naive. Because if you look at Matthew 5.5 5, and you've got a good cross-reference kind of Bible, it's going to send you back over to Psalm 37. Now, if your Bible doesn't do that, I'm doing it to you now. Take a look over at Psalm 37. Hold your finger in Matthew 5. And let's see if Jesus has a backdrop for what he's saying in Matthew 5.5. 5. This is where a reading of the New, as read with the lens of the Old Testament, is extremely helpful. If you jump right to the New Testament, especially books like the book of Revelation, and you just have discarded the Old Testament, you're lacking a major part of the data, folks. And so in Matthew 5.5, 5, it's very important, I think, that we recognize that Jesus is using an Old Testament text as his backdrop. The text is Psalm 37. If you look at Psalm 37 now, just glancing through this with me, uh, look at 37 verse 9. Evildoers will be cut off, those who wait for the Lord. They will inherit the land or the earth. Same, same phrase. It's an echo from the New Testament back into Psalm 37. You glance down a little bit further. He says it over and over again here. Uh, it says, I think, a total of four times. Look at Psalm 37 and verse 22. Look at 37, 22. Those blessed by him will inherit the land or the earth. On the other hand, those cursed by him will be cut off. I'm not going to read all of the references in Psalm 37, but let's move back to Matthew 5.5 5 and see if we can't make sense of what Jesus is doing. Paul is very notorious for taking an Old Testament promise that rests in Old Testament ideals and expectations 
and kind of giving them an update in a New Testament kind of spiritual way. And I think what Jesus is doing is virtually the same thing. For the Old Testament people, if you were David or Solomon or one of the Jews, what would you have wanted to have heard if God were going to make you a promise of coming blessing? Well, and inheriting the land of Canaan might suit your palate. But for Jesus, he's taking that kind of promise from God and expecting them to make the transposition into a new context. For the Christians, for people who are listening to Jesus, and inheriting the promised land in Canaan is hardly satisfactory. For David or Solomon, that might have worked. But what Jesus is doing is he's updating it a bit, and he's expecting us to read Psalm 37, this promise, you will inherit the land, but to transpose it into our own context, which is to say this then. I don't think Jesus is reading that remark literalistically. I think that what Jesus is doing is he is expecting us to read the promise, you'll inherit the land, but say, but how does such a promise fit for me? An inheritance of a physical land is just simply not what Jesus, I think, is wanting us to take from Matthew 5.5. 5. Thumbs up or thumbs down if that makes sense. Okay, nobody ever shows me thumbs down. I don't know if you're being dishonest or you're just hiding your, your thoughts from me or whatever. But uh, I think that in Matthew 5.5, 5, he's expecting us to read it now through our own lens, though it had once been written through David or Solomon or another fellow Old Testament Jews kind of anticipation. Let's move on to a second point. The idea of a renovated earth is expected because of a literal reading of the prophets, and Revelation. I listened to Dan Owen on a 30-minute little expose he did on this idea of a renewed heavens and a new earth. And he talks about heaven and earth coming, becoming one at the second coming of Christ. Look, folks, the exegetical work by these gentlemen, I'm trying to be fair here, is shoddy at best. I mean, it is shoddy at best. Flip over to Isaiah 65 with me for a moment. You have this phrase, the new heavens and the new earth only four times in your entire, bibli entire biblical works. Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, 2 Peter 3, and Revelation 21. There are four references to this idea of a new heavens and a new earth. I'm saying this, to read these texts as literal, raises a thousand questions and a trillion problems. It says in Isaiah 65, if you drop down to about verse 20, well, I need to show you that this is the passage about the new heavens and new earth. Look at 6517. 6517, behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered or come into mind. Take a look at this in 6520. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought a curse. Now, folks, we're in the context of the new heavens and the new earth, right? If we read this as strictly a literal expose, is there going to be death in the new heavens and the new earth, 60, uh, 65 verse 20? Will infants live to be 100 years old and then die? That doesn't sound like heaven. I'm arguing that we need to be reading figuratively here. Look across the page at 66. Look at 66.22. 66.22 has it again. Just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. Now catch this. If you back up to 66.21 in the same context, he says in 66.21 that he's going to gather some of the individuals for priests and for Levites. All of this business in heaven let me tell you what I think about it, for whatever that's worth. In Isaiah 65 and 66, the people are camped out in Babylonian Assyrian exile. And imagining the best of the best, the prophet looks into the future and starts painting with broad strokes about what kind of day the Jews would want to lie ahead. No more infants dying. No more looking to who's going to be our priest or who's going to be a Levite. They're all over the place, and God will select a number of them. The prophet imagines a better day, a day after the Assyrian Babylonian crisis. It's not an accident. Hold this thought. It's not an accident that when we get to the book of Revelation, that's a new enemy. But John is using the same metaphors, the same figures of speech. But he calls the, the enemy, he calls the enemy, Revelation 14, we saw this last week, he terms the enemy Babylon. 
and to predict or to pronounce a forthcoming deliverance from whomever the new oppressor in Revelation is, calling them Babylon, he too gives an idealistic vision of a new heavens and a new earth. If everything on this planet were set right, this is what it looks like. But flip over to Revelation with me then and look at Revelation 21. In Revelation 21, we have these kind of descriptors. We looked at a couple of these last week. But whatever we make of Revelation, it's locked into the time frame that it's at hand and it's quickly to come to pass. 1, 1, 1, 3, 22, 6, 22, 10. And when you get to Revelation 21 and he talks in verse 1, he saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down out of heaven. He's talking about an image. He's talking about a figure of speech, which is to say that the era of the oppressor is behind us. It's as if in the drama, in the vision, this old order of Domitian, the Roman emperor, is passing away and God's order is successful and back on top once more. That's the point he's making. Now, if that's not clear enough, and I know there's some exegetical work that needs to be sorted out there, but you drop down to 21.9 with me and see this. Whatever he's talking about, 21.9 has it said this way. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, which are actually dumped out on the Roman beast, so says 16, came and spoke with John in the drama, in the vision, and said this, Come here, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. What we have is a picture, an elaborate picture, a highly metaphorical figurative picture, in the vision, in the drama, of the triumphant bride of Christ who has lived faithfully even through the wicked regime of the Roman emperor, Domitian. I think that Revelation 21 is a picture of the triumphant church in the first century, and if we can't make the adequate transposition into our own key, we're not reading the text the best. We ought to still see that God is still spurning us to faithfulness now. And I think there are a trillion passages elsewhere that talk about the second coming, the heavenly home that we've got. I just don't think Revelation 21 is saying a whole lot about that. It's in a context of the Roman deal. And it sits an awful lot like the way that Isaiah's new heavens and new earth sat as well. Well, let's take a look at one more passage, and that is 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, this is a tricky little deal. And if you have a take on this text and you feel compelled to share it with me later, you go ahead and do that. And I promise you I'll try to be as respectful as I know how to be. This is 2 Peter 3. We have one of three ways we can go with this. And I'm afraid I should only give you one, but I'll say what I say. Um, yeah. Uh, 2 Peter 3 has it this way. You look at 3.1. He says, I'm writing the second epistle to you. And he says, I'm stirring your, way up, your minds up by way of reminder. He talks about the last days that are ahead, 3-3, three, three, knowing that, first of all, in the last days, mockers will come and say this, that, or the other. They're going to deny that God, God will ever judge this wicked world. You drop down into 3, 5 through 7, and he uses the uh, events with Noah as a backdrop. You remember how God flooded the world, he says? Well, he's able to judge it again. And in 3-8, he says it this way of 2 Peter 3, 3-8, three, with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like one day. He's quoting Psalm 90, verse 10. And then in verse 9, he assures us that God wants people to be saved. Now, here's where the difficulties, if we allow that term to stand, here's where the difficulties come in in 3.10. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And he says in 3.12, we should be looking for and hastening the, hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. But 3.13, here's your fourth case of this phrase, the new heavens and the new earth. He says, but on the other hand, according to his promise, we are looking for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. I have a number of thoughts here, but let me tell you the first two at least. The first one is this. Some of the Greek texts are questionable as to whether or not there's going to be a destruction or if it's going to be a purification. And so there's a big debate between all of the big hitters in theological studies. Should we read 2 Peter 3 as being a refining of the planet or it should, be a, should it be an annihilation, a burning up, a consummation of the planet? And I'm convinced, I'm convinced that whatever we make of the text, it is saying, it is saying that the earth is going to be burned up with fire. 
So here's my point. The first view would be to say that this is actually a purification and what's going to happen at the second coming is that earth is going to be refined by fire, like a purifying fire, and then the saved are going to come back home to earth, which will be renewed without the curse, and heaven will be lived on earth. That's the first view. The second view is to say that, no, that's not true. This is a literal burning by fire. The world's going to go out of existence. And that's the second view. And to say that this is not going to be a purification, it's going to be an annihilation of the planet. That's the second view. Now, my view presently leans somewhere like this. I think that Peter is a Jew writing to fellow Jews who is using apocalyptic literature, who is styling his discourse exactly like that of the earlier teacher, the master teacher, Jesus of Nazareth. And in Matthew chapter 24, he presents this cataclysmic picture where the world is bombed out of existence, the moon is turned to blood, stars are turned to darkness. Uh, you get the idea. All of these things are going on, but it's apocalyptic imagery. And what he's talking about is the crisis, the oppressor being brought down. I wonder, in light of 2 Peter 3, if there's enough context here to support this idea, that what 2 Peter is actually doing as well is talking about a day where the oppressor is completely taken away. Who might the oppressor be? If I'm reading the context right, I wonder if he's not talking about AD 70 and the fall of Jerusalem, where the Judaic system is coming to a close. Press me on it. You send me an email and see if that's not right. I'll, I'll send you some resources. But here's what I'm aiming for then. You've got four passages that talk about the new heavens and the new earth. Isaiah 65 and 66, 2 Peter 3, and Revelation 21. And I think they're all saying the same thing. The oppressor doesn't stand a chance against God. And God is going to see to it that judgment prevails, righteousness prevails. And it's up to people like you and me, whether we're in the immediate context of Isaiah, Peter, or Revelation, to make the correct reading and say, we've got to be faithful to God. Now, here's what I'm aiming for in 2 Peter 3 specifically. Whatever we make of this text, it will not allow, as far as I can tell, it will not allow this idea that heaven will be on earth. It just won't allow it. There is no, I'd say a lot more about this if I had the time, but you'd get bored and we'd run out of time too. But uh, you shouldn't get bored. I'm joking with you. But anyway, uh, I need to say this. I'm not even close to convinced that 2 Peter 3 will allow for this idea that the earth is going to be purified by fire. That's just not what's being gone for here. It's a complete consummation by fire. But I'm wondering, that's the image we get. Does that image symbolize something else, or is that a literalistic picture? That's what I'm holding in question. So you think about it, send me an email or something like that, and we'll pursue it longer. Take a look at Romans 8, and we'll bring this fourth point to a close. <laughs> Romans 8, if there is any, any text that the idea of a renovated earth, heaven on earth view has, I think Romans 8 would be the strongest. But I'm not persuaded by that at all either. Uh, if you're taking notes, jot down Acts 3.21 where he talks about the restitution of all things. Uh, Acts 3.21, the restitution of all things. But Romans 8, as we read this morning, has it. The creation, verse 20, was subjected to futility. When Adam took of the fruit, the whole thing uh, it got wrecked. And he says in 8.22, we know that the whole creation, the whole planet, he says, is in disruption. It groans and it suffers even until now. And not only, it's, it's not just for the, the non-Christians that this world still has its problems. He says even we, Christians, that is, 8.23, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, whatever we make of that phrase, even we are still groaning. Even you and I still have back pains. Even you and I still get MRIs. That's what he's aiming at in 8.23. And so he says, don't think that the world is wrecked just for the non-Christians. It's also for the saints. And so he gives us this picture. Ever since Adam, the world's had the curse. And the renovated earth, refurbished earth, uh, renewed earth view, heaven on earth, that idea tries to say that what heaven's going to be like is earth without the curse. Now, I read John Mark Hicks from Lipscomb. And he tries to argue, catch this, he and some of his buddies try to argue that there are going to be roller coasters on earth as part of heaven. Folks, we're getting very trivial. We're getting very trivial. Yeah, lips come uh, you know. But at this point, is heaven even looking like heaven anymore? Theme parks, amusement parks in heaven. Look, I'm not necessarily sold on the idea that it's going to be an everlasting prayer meeting. But the idea of theme parks as being what heaven is like, 
I'm just not sure we're even close to on point. If the renovated earth has anything that looks to me to be a good argument, it looks like it would be a reversal of whatever happened at Eden going backwards and the curse is removed. But even if that were the case, what would heaven be like? I'm not real sure. Point number five, why would you want to go to heaven? Well, for this, it's not boring or tedious. I'm not exactly sure what all is going to be up in heaven. I hope there's Bible study, you know. I really do. I really do. Uh, I think that the best way that we have right now to get close to God is by studying the Bible. And we learn more about him, and we learn more about him telling us who we need to be. And so I hope that there's something like that there, though I'm certain there's not. But whatever, have, whatever heaven has, I'm certain it's going to be better than here. And I can't be one of those who thinks that heaven's coming to earth. I just can't be. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, a passage we looked at this morning, he says, The things that we do see, the materials, the natural world, these things are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. Whatever our invisible heavenly home looks like, it's something that we've got to learn to see by faith and to live accordingly so that we might spend an eternity with God there. It's the best thing that God's bringing home to us. It's a home that's worth living and dying for. I think we sing a song that says something like, heaven will be worth it all. Heaven will surely be worth it all. And if that's not the case, then God's not faithful and everything he's aiming for, well, it's null and void. Heaven is a, and place isn't the right word, but it's a place for the faithful. It's a place of spiritual existence. It's a place inhabited at the second coming. It's a place that's not on earth, it's otherworldly, and it's a place of perfection. It's not born, it's a place worth living and dying for. This evening, if you're not in Christ, we invite you to obey his gospel, believe on him as the risen Lord, confess him as the risen Lord, repent of a past wicked way of life, and be baptized in his name for the remission of sins. Acts chapter 8, 26 through 38. If you're not a child of God this evening, we invite you to become one. But if you are and you've heard, you've fallen away, you need to come home, whatever needs you might have, won't you come as together we stand and say. aside for those who are not able to take this morning do we have any individuals that would like to take all right we'll be preparing our minds with hymn number 386 and we'll sing the first stanza 386 
Let's pay for the bread. Father, we thank you for this unleavened bread which you have commanded us to use to remember the Son of your, the body of your Son that hung on the cross on our behalf because we could not take away our own sin. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we're again thankful for this fruit of the vine that Jesus commanded we use to remember the blood that he shed on the cross. By it, we're able to have our sins forgiven in obedience to the gospel which he had preached and commanded through his disciples, the apostles, and take it into all the world. We are recipients of it today, just as they were then. We thank you for it, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. matter of convenience, we'll also pray for the contribution. Father, we're thankful for the blessings you give us every day. May we not take them for granted too much. You know that we do sometimes. We're thankful that we can give for the work of the church here in this place, and that by it we can glorify your name. Help us to use it in ways we may not have in the past. We look for opportunities to tell others about you. Thank you for this opportunity, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We sing in hymn number 738, first and the third stanza, and we led closing prayer. 738. Take the name of Jesus Father, we thank you for the blessings you give us. We thank you for this day we've had to worship you. Uh, 
Uh, we pray that it's been pleasing in your sight. Uh, we thank you that we've been able to learn some about heaven, and we look forward and we trust you, Lord, that you will uh, have great things prepared for us there. And help us as we uh, walk through the walk of this life and help us to be pleasing in your sight. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.